Penn and a faculty university. And I'd like to welcome you to the keynote address of the Academic Engagement Network's sixth regional short course. Um, first, want to thank Benji Kaplan and Minnesota Hillel for hosting us this evening, and also to express my gratitude to Steve Hunigs and the JCRC of Minnesota and the Dakotas for helping to coordinate and having Ambassador Ross here with us this evening. Um, and thank you so much for joining us in person at Hill's beautiful facility. I've been told that this is the first in-person event that's being held here um, and uh, that you're welcome to explore the building, the new facility uh, after tonight's program. Um, and uh, I also want to welcome by Zoom AEN members of our organization from across the country who are joining uh, and also those who are joining through JCRC's Zoom. So beginning yesterday, a group of faculty from universities and colleges across the country, all members of AEN began a four-day learning experience to better understand contemporary Israel and to develop strategies for countering the anti-Israel hostility that we see on so many campuses today. As students and campus professionals here this evening can likely attest to, anti-Israel rhetoric and activism very often crosses the line into anti-Semitism, at best because of ignorance and at worst because of deep-seated forms of hate. In bolstering the knowledge and skill sets of our faculty members, we at AEN empower them to respond effectively to challenges on their campuses and to support students who are also facing adversity. AEN is now in its sixth year. We're growing strong. We have over 800 professors across all ranks and disciplines in our network, including many from the University of Minnesota and from 250 other campuses around the country. AEN is nonpartisan. It's an educational nonprofit. We're committed to academic freedom, campus free expression, while also fostering a welcoming, inclusive learning environment for Jewish and all students. And the organization is the brainchild of Mark Udoff. Um, Mark, as many of you know, is the former president of the University of California, who also served as president of the Ford Campus University of Minnesota. So Mark is here tonight, and I hope you'll have a chance to meet him afterwards. And I know he's delighted to see good friends and colleagues again. I think it's fitting that we're holding our sixth short course here in Minneapolis. The Minneapolis community has shown remarkable resilience and bravery in the face of anti-Semitism perpetrated threats made against Jewish institutions and landmarks here uh, recently. And in the face of darkness, you have been a light. And indeed, right now, perhaps more than ever, we need reasons for hope, beacons of light to help guide us into the future. At AEN, we believe that the Abraham Accords are one such source of hope. The Abraham Accords declaration calls for mutual understanding and coexistence cooperation and dialogue, tolerance and respect, among other ideals, reflecting the age-old Jewish precept to be rodfei shalom, or pursuers of peace. And the declaration is also a testament to dogged diplomacy and the hope that Israel and her neighbors can find mutually beneficial ways to coexist. This year, AEN is embarking on a year-long initiative to raise awareness on campuses about the meaningful and significant new reality emerging in the Middle East region. These positive current developments can be tapped to counter the anti-normalization narratives of Israel's detractors. Tonight's keynote, the Abraham Accords and the Normalization of Israel in the Middle East is our kickoff event for this initiative. And the speaker we selected, Ambassador Dennis Ross, is no stranger to the intense work of diplomacy. For over five decades, he has played a leading role in shaping U.S. foreign policy and peace initiatives in the Middle East. He has served in five U.S. presidential administrations and was awarded 
the Presidential Medal for Distinguished Federal Civilian Service by President Clinton. He is the author of several influential books on Israel and the Middle East peace process. And currently, Ambassador Ross is counselor and William Davidson Distinguished Fellow at the Washington Institute for Near East Policy. And he continues to be called upon for and to generously offer his wisdom, his time, and his guidance on a range of foreign policy issues. And we very much look forward to hearing his insights this evening. Ambassador Ross will speak for about 30 minutes and will then open up the floor to your comments and to your questions, and we'll close the event um, shortly after nine. And so please give me, uh, give, please join me in giving a very warm welcome to Ambassador Dennis. Um, thank you. And let me say, Miriam, it's, if I've done it for five decades, I obviously was a kid when I started. <laughs> Um, actually, maybe four decades, but you know, it, it, who's who's quibbling? Uh, look, I'm I'm really proud to to speak here on behalf of the AAF. I think what you're doing is not just necessary; it it should be seen as a mission. Uh, it almost requires a missionary zeal because what we are collectively up against is this almost a sinister narrative. Uh, that is not informed by substance, certainly not informed by fact, uh, and that spreads a really a dangerous mythology. Uh, and the way you deal with mythologies is by taking them on. Uh, and so I, I applaud what you're doing. Um, I also teach at Georgetown. I actually, just before dinner, I, I did my class tonight on Zoom, even though we're back in session. It's a class on the history of the Arab-Israeli conflict and the efforts to resolve it. Uh, and my students are, you know, from, you can imagine they're from every walk of life, including from the Middle East. And my, my aim is not to give a particular point of view, but to create a basis of fact in which to think about how to approach the issue of the conflict uh, and the conflicting Arabs. I actually start off with a lecture on the Israeli narrative looking at the roots of Zionism, then I look at the Arab narrative and then separately the Palestinian narrative because the Arab and Palestinian narratives are not the same. And I know my topic tonight is uh, the Abraham Accords and the normalization process. And I promise by the end of my talk, I'll come back to that. But I, I, I could easily just address that and I could talk about how to come about you know, how can you use the Abraham Accords to break the stalemate between Israelis and Palestinians? How, in a sense, it's kind of a reversal of what was the historical notion of linkage. Linkage was you really couldn't do anything with the Arabs until you had resolved the Israeli-Palestinian issue. And the notion of what I call kind of reverse linkage is using normalization as a way to break the stalemate between Israelis and Palestinians. And I promise I'll come back to that. But I, I really want to start taking several steps back. And I want, to, I want to open the aperture much wider. I want to deal more with us generally, where the US is right now, and what the US role in the world is, uh, and the challenges to pursuing the kind of role in the world that President Biden talks about. Uh, and I would use that to then get us to the Middle East and ultimately to, to normalization and the different pathways that are, or choices that are, are there within the region. You know, it would, be, it would be surreal if I didn't start by saying something about Afghanistan, because obviously Afghanistan has affected the way the US is perceived right now. Even there, the discussion on Afghanistan frequently was focused on kind of the wrong issue. The question of whether we stayed or we left was a debatable but defensible proposition, meaning President Biden's decision to get out is certainly defensible. You can debate whether this was the smartest thing to do in terms of longer term counterterrorism, but the idea that we could stay at no cost uh, with us walking away from the withdrawal agreement 
the, the Trump administration made a withdrawal agreement from Afghanistan, not a peace agreement from Afghanistan. The only part of that agreement that the Taliban lived up to was not attacking American forces. So the minute it became clear that we were walking away from the withdrawal agreement, they would then start attacking American forces. And you can still say, okay, we could have managed that. Uh, maybe the costs were tolerable. Uh, and, and those costs, unfortunately, would be measured in blood in terms of the loss of American troops or forces. But you could say that the, the benefits of being there in terms of countering terror uh, justified it. The flip side was to say, okay, those costs weren't justifiable. We could, and this is the administration's case, we could address them in other ways. Uh, we could deal with counter terror in other, in other ways. Uh, and that if we didn't get out now, we would be there forever in a place where we actually don't have vital national security interests. This is not the same as Korea, not the same as Japan, not the same as Europe. So my point is you can debate this issue and what the administration did is defensible. What wasn't defensible was the way it was carried out. Uh, and here the problem had much more to do with the president making a decision to override the military, but then allowing the military to determine what the withdrawal would be like, where the only objective for the military, which is understandable, was the safety of our forces. And as our, force, as our forces shrank in, in numbers, they shrunk in numbers, they would become much more vulnerable. Therefore, you had to get out stealthily in an uncoordinated way, much more quickly than anybody knew. And you ended up creating a kind of illogic where you withdrew your forces before you withdrew the civilians. So the identifying the right mission, which was, okay, we did one mission was the safety of our forces, but other missions were being able to withdraw all those who depended on us, all those to whom we had a moral obligation. All right, so that's the essence of what needed to be discussed and where the administration made its mistake was in a sense, allowing the military to define the exclusive mission of our forces. Now the overwrought reaction to this was that America lost its credibility. And I will say, I'll use a diplomatic term here. That's absurd. It's absurd because we're still the most powerful country in the world, at least economically and militarily. We demonstrated that we did something that no one else could do, which was withdraw over 120,000 people in 11 days. Again, highlighting our wherewithal. Uh, we have many friends and allies who depend on us or at least face threats and they really don't have an alternative to us. So inherently, we still have a kind of credibility, but much depends upon us. Much depends upon what we will do and how we will act. Uh, and you know, that then gets back to, okay, how, we, how do we define our role in the world? The president very much talks about building back better. He very much talks about meeting a rules-based uh, international order. Uh, all that is true, but we're facing a couple of different realities than we did before. One reality is this isn't the 1990s where we were the Uber power. This isn't even the period after 9-11 when still no one could really compete with us in terms of power. Uh, the Russians in the 1990s, you know, Soviet Union had collapsed economically, they had collapsed. Uh, they weren't in a position to challenge us. Uh, the Chinese into the early 2000s were very much focused on, again, their whole approach to modernization, bringing 800 million people out of poverty. They were playing according to what seemed to be our rules. What's different today is they challenge us. Both of them are challenging us, and they're challenging us structurally. They're challenging us in terms of trying to make it clear that you know, the rules-based system isn't going to be our rules. It's going to be theirs. And we will have to be able to compete with them more effectively. The president is right that we have to restore alliances. We have to be able to share the burden so that we can lead again. But what we also have to do is we have to have enough of a domestic consensus on what our role is to be able to carry this off. And here's where we face a different kind of challenge now. And it's a challenge that comes from the right and the left. 
you know, I often say that the political spectrum is not a straight line, but it goes in a circle. You know? I mean, you look at, uh, if you look at Rand Paul, the Koch brothers, the Quincy Institute, and you look at the position of the squad, progressives, they have very similar attitudes when it comes to America's role in the world or the absence of it. They don't believe that we should be as engaged as we have been. Certainly it's fair to raise questions about it. They think our military footprint internationally is dramatically overblown and they actually blame our military presence for most of the problems that we face in the world. If you listen carefully to them, you know, threats from countries wouldn't exist except for us. If you will listen carefully, if it wasn't for the US, you know, Iran wouldn't be a threat, which I think it would be news to everybody who lives in the Middle East. Uh, the fact is 150,000 rockets that Hezbollah has, uh, is that because of the American military footprint? Uh, 600,000 dead in Syria, is that because of the American military footprint? The Iranian effort to create a precision guided, uh, a, a precision guided missile project, again, to take those 150,000 rockets that Hezbollah has, and it won't be all 150,000, but tens of thousands of those make them highly accurate. Again, none of this is driven by us, but it is driven by what Iran seeks in the region, which among other things is the US to be out. They see Israel as a threat in no small part because they see it as an obstacle to their ability to achieve what they want in the region, which is hegemony. So when we, when we think about what we have to contend with, we actually have to present the world as it is, and we also have to present the Iranians as they are. Uh, right now, the Iranians have adopted what I call a Trumpian maximum pressure policy towards us. You see it in terms of what they're doing in the region. Uh, you know, they are much more active in the region in terms of what they, the kinds of threats they pose. We you know just take off a few examples of the kinds of things that they do. You know, when they, I guess this is now six to eight weeks ago, they attacked the Mercy Street, which was a ship that, uh, in which the Iranians directly, not through a proxy, the Iranians directly launched drones against it, killed the Romanian captain, killed the, the, the British security officer on the ship. We identified, we announced that this was a direct threat against freedom of navigation. Uh, no big deal from their standpoint, there was no consequence for this. The, uh, a couple of weeks ago, they attacked a base in Erbil where we are present. That was, uh, by my count, the 31st attack that they've carried out over the course of, since the beginning of this year, against bases in Iraq where our forces are present. Uh, we see the Houthis have responded to almost every initiative for a ceasefire by upping the ante uh, within Yemen, uh, meaning upping the ante in terms of attacks against Saudi Arabia. Uh, we look at what they're doing in the nuclear area where they're enriching to 60%. They've normalized enriching to 60%, which is, it takes you one week once you've enriched to 60% to go from there to 90%, which is weapons grade. They are producing uranium metal. The IEA says that their justification for this, which is uh, they want to produce metal plates for the Tehran Research Reactor, which is a medical reactor originally built by the United States. Uh, the IEA says uh, the uranium metal they're creating could not be used in the TRR, and they've also said there is no legitimate, justifiable civilian purpose for creating uranium metal. It is used to create cores of bombs. Uh, they are installing advanced cascades of centrifuges. They pretty much have put the IAEA in a position where it can't monitor what they're doing. In some cases, they didn't give, they didn't allow them access to cameras. In other cases, they allowed them to put new batteries in, but they don't give them the data. Uh, and especially when they're producing uranium enriching to 60%, they could be diverting small amounts of that away and we wouldn't know. 
I'm not, I'm high, highlighting this. This is all designed to create pressure in the Q&A. We can talk about why they're doing it, but this is not the only area where they put pressure on. So a week ago Friday, uh, there was a conference in Erbil. 312 Iraqis showed up. Uh, one of the leaders of the Sahwa, the Awakening Movement, uh, was one of the leaders of, of this conference. Uh, there were Shia there, including from the Jaburi tribe, which is one of the largest tribes in Iraq. Interesting enough, it has a Sunni and a Shia wing. And Major General Abir was also there. He's from the Shia wing. You know, there was uh, Dr. Sahar was a, was a minute was a, uh, was a philosophy professor, but also a member of the Ministry of Culture, who was there. They gave addresses on the Abraham Accord, and theirs was a call to join the Abraham Accords. And the call to join the Abraham Accords, each of them made their own kind of presentation, but the point boiled down to. We want a future for Iraq. We want a future for Iraq that again, creates equality among all peoples here, but creates a possibility, creates the potential for progress, offers some economic hope. We want to create a people to people to connection, especially with those Israelis whose families came from Iraq. This was a message purely of peace and reconciliation. All of them then became subject to direct threats. In the case of Dr. Sar, she was fired from the Ministry of Culture, given Iranian Shia militia pressures. Uh, she went into hiding. All of them have now been evacuated out. Hezbollah at the time said, look, if the Iraqi government doesn't arrest them or go after them, we'll go kill them. I want you to think about, okay, you feel they're obviously against peace, but they feel so threatened by it. You have to ask yourself, why do they feel so threatened by it? Because it represents an entirely different pathway for the future. What this group in Erbil was doing was saying, look, we, we know what the Iranian pathway is for the Middle East. You know, I like to say the Iranians have three exports. They export, I should say four. They export rockets, cruise missiles, militias, and failed states. And the Iraqis know what they do within Iraq to hold them back. You know, those who went, by the way, when I, I was describing some who went to Erbil, some of the some of those who were there weren't just intellectuals, they were also the those who led the urban demonstrations, this is the urban youth who led the demonstrations in 2019 and 2020, almost entirely Shia, who see what Iran is doing through the Shia militias, both in terms of its corruption and in terms of holding back any possibility of real change. So what they were saying is there's two pathways, there's two choices for the Middle East. One choice, is a choice that says, you know, we can have food security, water security, health security in an environment where climate change is producing drought and threatens all of these. One says we can build economies based on digital technologies and education. One says that we can have hope for our kids and for our future. And the other is a pathway that guarantees conflict for sure. And the axis of resistance, which is the way Iran speaks about it, they speak about it that way because they have an ideology that justifies them holding power. If it doesn't create change for the better, it almost guarantees that there's no possibility of that. So think about the fact that 312 people in Iraq from very different walks of life, different demographics, different sects, different tribes, different ages, went there to embrace the Abraham Accords because they saw it represented a real possibility for the future. In fact, it offered a sense of hopefulness at a time when there's very little. And it offers, in a sense, the what I call possibility at a time when there is very little. Uh, 
in any of the states where Iran holds dominance. So what the Abraham Accords represent is what they saw in it. Now, why this brings me back to where I, I said I would come. Historically, I understand why the Palestinians reacted the way they did, reflexively to it, because they see normalization as the incentive for Israel to give up occupation. Our problem today is the Palestinians are completely split, incapable of making any decision. Of course, Hamas is against the idea of any peace because it represents a radical Sunni Islamist ideology, just the way the Shia militias and Iran represent a radical Shia Islamist ideology. You know, maybe there are elements in Hamas that can be split off, but they have a fundamental ideology and in many ways, this is a cult-like group. The Palestinian Authority <laughs> lacks a whole lot of legitimacy and credibility, on the other hand. So there's a basic division between the two. As I've often said, pretty hard to make peace when there's no peace among Palestinians. It's pretty hard for them to be able to make peace with the Israelis. The Israelis have an unprecedented government. I don't need to tell you it's unprecedented. You know it's unprecedented. What makes it interesting is literally every ideology in Israel is represented in this government, in addition to having the Arabs for the first time. But they don't agree on what the outcome should be with Palestinians. So on big issues, they can't make moves. Uh, they have bought the, the kind of Mika Goodman approach, at least as a slogan, which is shrinking the conflict, which in the current circumstance, and I'm sure that uh, you've heard earlier today, that that may not, you know, from the standpoint of actually trying to reduce points of friction, making progress on the ground, that's useful. It won't change the fundamental political stalemate. If you wanna break the political stalemate, then you need a new element. And you have one new element in the region. And that's the Abraham Accords of Normalization. Now, what the UAE did, and you have to, to understand the background to the Abraham Accords, you have to understand the initiative for it came from the UAE, not from the Trump administration. What happened in early July was you had the that the UAE basically approached the administration and said, we can give you a win. We can give you, you know, the first Arab peace agreement since 19, with Israel since 1994. Now there's a price. The price is twofold. One is that annexation of the territory allotted to Israel under the Trump plan has to be, uh, it's not just put on hold, basically it's put to the side. And the truth is for at least four years. Maybe at the time said this was a pause, a suspension. No, it was, there was a deal here, at least for four years, no annexation. Uh, now, that gives you a kind of interesting model because what the UAE in effect said, they also wanted certain weapon systems they've been denied under the rubric of qualitative military edge. Their justification was, we're gonna be exposing ourselves to greater threats. So F-35s and predator drones, we get that. But the fundamental point here was they didn't forsake the Palestinians, although the Palestinians felt that way, because what they said is we will prevent, in return for normalization, full normalization, we will prevent the annexation. Now, there is a way to, to use that model, to replicate that model. Understand that the UAE did not simply go from, where, from zero to now 100%. And I'll tell you a little story. The uh, beginning of the Obama administration, uh, Yusuf Atebu calls me up and says, look, can, could you come? Uh, I'd like to have a meeting so we can discuss what's going on in the region. I said, sure, fine. I said, why don't you leave the building? And uh, I have a suite at the, at the Ritz-Carlton. Why don't you come over and we'll talk about it? Okay, this is February 2009. So I get to the, I get to the hotel, get to the door. He opens the door. He's standing there and Sly Meridor is standing there. Israel's ambassador to the United States. The message was in that in their presence. We see the region the same way. We want to talk to be sure you understand or you see the region the way we see the region. The UAE has been building a relationship with Israel. Some of it was subterranean, but starting in 2015, they allowed the Israelis to have an office in the International Renewable Energy Agency. 
After that, they then allowed different Israeli delegations to come. Pre-COVID, they were going to allow the Israelis to have a pavilion uh, in what was supposed to be Expo 2020. And Israelis were going to be able to travel there on their own passports. So they were moving towards normalization, but they, over actually over more than a decade, they then decided to take a big leap based on what I said. Now, others can also do this in stages. And in return for what they might do in stages, then they can ask Israel to take certain steps towards the Palestinians. Now, I will tell you one thing. No one else in the Arab world is going to do what the UAE did, meaning take the initiative. We will have to broker it. And the way you do this, if I were doing what I used to do, I'd be going privately, for example, to the Saudis, and I would be laying out to them, here are the kind of steps you could take. Now, what are the, but, and I'll give you an example, my favorite example, but I, I could give you 10 different examples. Let's say to the Saudis, you don't have to make a 100% move to full normalization. But make, if you make a political move, then you can ask something from of the Israelis to respond in a political way. So for example, let's say, especially given Vision 2030 and what you're trying to do in terms of uh, advancing your economy, digitalizing it and the like. Uh, let's say that you open a commercial trade office in Tel Aviv. So what would be a political equivalent of that on the Israeli side? Well, a political equivalent of that, in my mind, would be Israel stops building to the east of the security barrier, meaning that stops creeping annexation. It has the virtue for the Saudis, if they were to do it, it means you preserve two states as an option. The problem with Israel continuing to build to the east of the barrier is that you will hit a tipping point at some juncture. I don't know exactly when it is, but you will. And when you get past that point and then it becomes very hard to separate, then two states as we know it becomes a very difficult option. So stopping creeping annexation doesn't produce two states, but it preserves it as an option. Now I know the Saudis today, and I will tell you, that just like with the other countries that did the Abraham Accords, it wasn't in the, it's really only the UAE who asked something specifically uh, that the Israelis move. In the case of Bahrain, in the case of Morocco, in the case of Sudan, it was all about what they got from us. Now the UAE got something from us as well. The Saudis will want something on the Palestinians, but they will want something even more from us. And that may be hard because of the image of Saudi Arabia, especially among parts of the Democratic Party right now. But here again, you have to weigh this. You have to weigh, what does it mean if we could actually use this major step to break the stalemate between Israelis and Palestinians? By the way, if I were doing what I was doing before, I would go to the Saudis in private and say, here are the possibilities. Let's talk about which one you could do. Let's talk about what you would want from the Israelis. Let's talk about what you'd want from the US. And once I had enough of this in my pocket, then I go to the Palestinians and say, okay, you know what? Here's what we can produce, but you don't get just to be in the receive mode. You also have to do something. The point is none of this will happen by itself. What the Abraham Accords offer is hope and a vision for the future, meaning that you can actually have a future. In the Middle East right now, you have a pathway that offers a future, uh, and you have a pathway that offers a perpetuation of the path of the past and a great deal of hopelessness. The Abraham Accords can be used not just to affect this broader landscape, but it can also be used, as I said, to break the stalemate between Israelis and Palestinians. It will require us to be more active than we've been. It will require us to play a broker's role. As I said, you're not going to see those others in the region. I don't see any of them taking the initiative on their own the way the Emirates did. But that doesn't mean much can't be done and much needs to be done. And again, it comes back to who we are. Are we prepared to play this kind of role? The good news about what I'm describing is it doesn't require a major military footprint, but it does require us to be sufficiently credible on military and security issues that those who are asked to take these steps have some reason to believe that we will be there for them if they face threats. And the truth is they will face threats. That's the reality. So 
a lot comes back to can we play the kind of role in the world that I think President Biden wants to play? Do we have the political wherewithal to be able to do it? Are there people like us who represent a constituency that believes in this and if we're prepared to use our voices and everything else we can do to help ensure that the U.S. continues to play the kind of role that is necessary, at least the one that I believe in? But I'll stop there. Hey, I'll agree. Great. <laughs> the, uh, this, this, this was a move. You get your comment on this directly. At one time, Israel was part of the NATO EU block. It is now going to be a superpower. Uh, so, what's that? Did everybody hear the question? Question, okay, everybody heard it? Yes, no, okay, so um, politics is one no, so. Um, the, Israel used to be part of uh, UCOM, used to be part of the, not NATO, but the European Command. Now it's part of CENTCOM. Uh, and the question was, is that significant? The answer is yes. I didn't go through, if, if I were giving a talk only on Iran, I would have focused very heavily on what it takes for us to restore Iran's fear and therefore deterrence. They have lost their fear of us. That's why we're facing a maximum pressure policy from them. Uh, one of the ways to do, there's a lot of different things we can do. And it's not only military, but it includes military. You know, I would say, if you really wanna deter Iran and restore their fear, you also, they have to see there's a cost as they measure it. So politically, we need to be able to isolate them. Uh, they don't see themselves being isolated right now, partly because they have support from the Russians and the Chinese. One of the ways to get that is for us to convince the Russians and Chinese, if they stay on the path where they're on, they're gonna leave us no choice, or the Israelis no choice, but to use force. In the case of the, the Chinese, that's the last thing they want in the region. They're the biggest importers of oil. So they need to know that if, if they continue on the path of allow, in a sense, facilitating, but they've been buying Iranian oil, they're making conflict more likely, which is against their own interests. So we need to sort of focus on what they need to be concerned about politically, I mean, to isolate them. Iran has a self-image. They're not North Korea. They're not the Hermit Kingdom. So isolating them matters. It's an element. You know, I, I like to use the term, you know, since I'm from California, I use it at dinner on a different issue. We need a holistic approach, political, economic, covert, public diplomacy, military, yes. Uh, you know, I've written an article where I said we should, we should give the Israelis a massive ordinance penetrator, or at least you know, be prepared to reach an understanding with the Israelis on the mass, giving them the massive ordinance penetrator, the MOP, 30,000 pound bomb, we developed it. It was developed during the Obama administration. Uh, there's one enrichment site the Iranians have that is built into a mountain. You hear bunker busters, insufficient to deal with Fordo. It's built into a mountain. And either it takes a nuclear weapon, but this was designed to be an alternative. A 30,000 pound bomb has a fuse that, is fuse that only ignites after it penetrates deep underground. Uh, the Israelis can deal with much of the, nu of the nuclear infrastructure in Iran. They can't deal with this site. But with the mop, they could. Now, if we were to give the Israelis the mop, you know, the message you would send to the Iranians is twofold. That the Iranians, if they, even if they doubt us, they don't doubt the Israelis. Uh, and secondly, this would send a signal we support the Israelis. So if you're looking for ways to enhance deterrence, there's a military dimension to this for sure. But getting to your question, we should be with CENTCOM as an umbrella. We can use it to integrate missile defenses in the region. We can use it to integrate counter drone technologies and options. We could use it to create contingency planning, drawing on the Israelis and, and the Arab members of CENTCOM to create a set of options to counter the use of the Shia militias. CENTCOM creates a perfect umbrella to do all sorts of military planning, create a division of labor, uh, the more you do of that, the more the Iranians become it. You run a number of exercises. 
with the different countries, including the Israelis. The, the fifth fleet is based in Bahrain. So, but I'm, your question was about CENTCOM, and my point is, there is so much that can be done under that umbrella that the Iranians will notice. They need to see we're preparing the kind of options that it's not just words. So I said, politically, work to isolate them. Economically, I mean, I would put pressure on them by saying, you know what, we're gonna offer them again vaccines. They're the worst country in the region when it comes to COVID and COVID deaths. And the Supreme Leader said it wouldn't take the vaccines from us and the British because they were poisoned. Okay, keep offering. By the way, Iran is a country that has more profound water problems than anybody else in the region through mismanagement because of drought. You know, you had demonstrations during the summer in Khuzestan where people were walking around with, with signs saying, I'm thirsty. Uh, this is a country that could run out of water in a decade or so. It can't sustain the population it has. I would offer, I would offer them things in the humanitarian area. It'll put them under more pressure. I want to put them in a position where they have an interest in reducing the pressure, but the pressure needs to be thought of more creatively. That's why politically, economically keep the sanctions, but offer vaccines, offer water help. I mean, I would, I would work along those lines and then I would, I would do the planning in CENTCOM. I would provide the MOP to the Israelis. I would do all these things. And the whole purpose is to restore their sense of fear, and you know that's where deterrence comes from. I mean, for those, if you really don't want to see force used, then you better, we better enhance deterrence because this is an Iranian government that is less risk averse. They have an ideology that's, it's not that Rouhani and Zarif weren't loyal to the Islamic Republic, but they, they didn't favor confrontation with us. This group favors confrontation with us because they think it helps them domestically. Yeah. Prime Minister Bennett of the UN didn't mention anything about the Palestinian Jews. Is ICE about that? Or why? Yes, I was surprised about that. Because it's a UN, because the Palestinian issue is real, you go and you, you make your case. You know, and he, I would have liked him, like I'll, I'll take a step back. I think what he's done so far as prime minister has been actually remarkably good. On this issue, I understand some of the, the difficulties, but I think on this issue, it would have been smart to simply make the case, say, of course, we want to produce peace with the Palestinians. That's in our interest. This is not a favor to the Palestinians. This is in our interest. Palestinians at this point have adopted positions that are quite hostile to us. You know, uh, but we, we are looking for ways to make progress. Why not? If you believe in shrinking the conflict, why not talk? We're looking for ways to reduce friction between us. We realize at this point, neither side is in a position to settle the conflict. But what can we do to change the climate? What can we do to change the circumstances so what isn't possible today can become possible over time? I would have preferred that he say that in the speech. I don't see how that would have cost him anything politically. Uh, you know, in the end, from some of his supporters, not to mention some within his government, it, it drew criticism that Palestinians weren't mentioned at the UN. Yeah. Then you talked about uh, people on the left and on the right meeting. Yeah. Uh, curious how we can speak in the conversation in America about the importance of. Israel and Israeli aid when there's such a loud voice that says military footprint bad anyway. Well, first of all, if you if you're talking about I mean, first, the first thing you have to do is you have to be able to identify that there is a threat there that potentially is going to come back to haunt us. And if you want to reduce America's military footprint, well then you become even more dependent upon those who can actually be of help to you. And Israel is certainly someone who can be of help to you. you know, it usually turns out that those who threaten us also threaten Israel and vice versa. 
So I think we have to talk about, first we have to make the case for where do we have interests? Where, where do we see threats? You know, President Biden wants us to play a leadership role. Uh, and for us to sustain a leadership role, we need partners who are prepared to share the burden. Uh, it becomes a lot easier for us to do it if we can point to partners who are prepared to share the burden. I think Israel here is one of those who helps to, to share that burden. But I think that the more basic question is we don't have the same kind of domestic consensus that once justified a certain American role in the world. We're gonna to have to look for ways to restore that. I focused on the left and the right that look, the, the center has shrunk here, and certainly from a political meaningful standpoint. And you know, those of us, I will put myself in the center, those of us who are center, you can be center left, you can be center right, we have an obligation to have our voices heard too. I mean, I don't know why the extremes get to be the ones who define, you know, the agenda and the boundaries. Raise it. My colleague. Just a bit on the last question. Uh, uh, the new three point bill was released. Uh, I'm sure the reason is saying affected this dynamic. Can you speak a bit about how the region sees this dynamic, how they interpret it? Um, are they worried impacting their policy choices? Uh, are, is there a sensitivity to some of these uh, ideas, whether burden sharing, whether being more open to Abraham Accords, or have they given up on uh, As someone who still goes to the region a lot, um, you know, they clearly, I mean, you know this, the perception of us right now is that. Um, we are withdrawing from the region. Uh, one of the attraction of Israel, by the way, is that they can't withdraw from the region and they have these interests so they can be counted on. Uh, what I sense, Wraith, is that there, there's this great ambivalence about us right now. There is a fear that we, that there's three presidents now that are signaling, you know, they won't, we don't want to be there. So it's no longer an aberration. It means we don't want to be there. Uh, and so some are hedging bets, for sure. We're seeing that already. But even as they hedge bets, there still is this fundamental desire for us to be there because they still don't really believe they can count on anybody else. So yeah, the climate is worse than it's been. Afghanistan definitely worsened it. I can make the arguments I did here to them about us. And at a certain level, they acknowledge it, but this is now a psychology and it's a perception. Uh, and so I, I sense deep worry on the part of those who have kind of depended on us. Now, to some extent, there are those who realize they have to do more. And in other cases, there are those, as you know, who are looking to, you know, can they give the Chinese a bit more of an interest in them? You know, they don't really trust the Russians. Many of them have a certain stake with the Chinese, but none of them think the Chinese, if they really got into trouble, would ever be there for them. So they hedge bets, but they, they still, it's like out of the corner of the eye, they still want to be able to count on us. And when they talk to people like me, you know, obviously they have an agenda. The agenda is their hope that people like me will persuade us to you know, to play a role we have in the past. I also say to them, yeah, you got to do your part. You want to make it easier for us to, to play the role? Do your part. Now, in a country like the UAE, to be fair, they're actually ready to do their part. Now they're emphasizing diplomacy, which is fine, because they say to some extent you can diffuse tensions, but they have no illusions about the Iranians. You know, they don't think, I mean, I saw this story today also about the Saudis that that is that they and the Iranians have agreed to a mechanism for restoring uh, relations and the embassy, but also bringing the Houthis, you know, to, to end the conflict. When I see language like restore mechanism, that tells me they're just beginning a process uh, and a mechanism can lead somewhere or it can lead nowhere. And it looks right now to me like it's 
a process that, whose purpose is to have a process, not necessarily a conclusion. So, you know, look, I'm uh, there. I would be misleading if I said there isn't a great deal of angst in the region about us. There is. But there still is a reality that they know there really is nobody else. So they'll, they'll hold out hope. And, you know, a lot depends upon what we do. You know, look, one of the things with the Biden administration is the emphasis that the, they want to pivot to Asia. You know, that's where the real interests are. But I, I had hoped, you know, going back to May and what happened in Gaza, I had hoped that, you know, this sent a message that if you want to focus on other priorities, you have to invest enough in the Middle East so you can. And if you don't, the Middle East will impose itself. It was, uh, when, when Jim Baker uh, was about to become Secretary of State and I was someone who was helping to manage the transition to him and then became you know, one of his close aides, and I was doing the initial set of briefings on a number of issues, including the Middle East. And he started off by saying to me, Dennis, I'm not going to do what, what Schultz did, fly around the Middle East. You know, that's kind of the graveyard of the Secretary of State. And I said to him, OK, fine, except that you, know, you may think you could ignore the Middle East, but it won't ignore you. And don't you want to be in a position where you are able to shape an agenda as opposed to them forcing the agenda on you? The Biden administration has to do enough in the Middle East to enable them to deal with their other priorities. And I think intellectually that's understood. Uh, you know, given everything they're dealing with, it's hard to do. And there's one other factor that is just new. I mean, it never used to take this long to get people confirmed in positions. So we still have, you know, we don't have an assistant secretary for NEA yet. And she's now had a hearing but she hasn't had a vote yet. I mean, we're in October. You know, how about ambassadors? We don't have ambassadors who've been confirmed. So you're, you're also creating a harder problem because and this gets back to some of the polarization here where you can't even put your people in place. So it makes it hard to do some of these things. I'm still hopeful that this recognizing you have to invest enough if you want to be able to deal with the other priorities. And if you do invest enough, then it also sends a signal to those you want to be prepared to take some steps to expose themselves. Others won't take steps to expose themselves if they think we're not going to be there for them. That's also part of the problem right now. I mean, I look at, again, this the Erbil conference was extraordinary in terms of people being prepared to go put themselves on the line. And the, I understand why the administration publicly was tepid, is probably the fair term, because they're very worried about October 10th and the election and academia and so forth. I would have liked them, at least publicly, to say people who are prepared to commit themselves to peace and run risk for peace you know, are worthy of support. I would like to see a little bit more of that. Yeah. A question. You talked about the politics mostly. Well, we're lucky enough to be blessed with Ilhan Omar as our, as our congressperson. How do you deal with someone, someone like her? It's, it's really tough. It's funny you ask the question because Steve, who's here, I, I asked him the same question today. <laughs> but, but actually, from a really honest standpoint, I'm saying not so much how do you deal, I was saying, is she open to a discussion? I mean, the real answer to your question is you talk to them. I, I don't believe that we shouldn't be prepared to engage with people who have attitudes which we have problems with. I mean, hell, I mean, I, you know, I know a lot of what you were talking about earlier was like BDS. I like to say, look, I've spent not 50 years, but at least 30 years. At least 30 years. No, I was a child prodigy. That allowed me to go out and do that. But, uh, yeah, I spent 30 years trying to end the conflict out there. And they want what they want to do is they want to import it here. And if that's not good enough, they want to bring it on the campuses. And they're against any dialogue. I don't know how 
right? How do you make peace with anybody if you can't talk to them? Right? So um, I, I would be very willing to talk to her. I suspect she might not be so interested in talking to me, but I'd be very willing to talk to her or anyone else. And, you know, say, look, here, I'm, I'm happy to listen to you. I'm happy to hear what you, how you see the region. I'm happy just as someone who's spent an awful lot of time out there to, you know, to explain the facts as I see them. I, you know, I always like to quote Daniel Patrick Moynihan, who said, everybody's entitled to their own opinion. They're just not entitled to their own facts. And I think part of our job is just to present facts. Now, facts, to be fair, can still be interpreted in different ways. But there still needs to be a baseline of this is what has happened. Now, what do you make of that? How do you, what conclusions do you draw from it? What are the implications? Maybe you have different interpretations of what the implications may be, but at least create the same baseline of facts. You know, I, I during May, I did 70 interviews, you know, with all the mainstream media. Uh, and in almost every single interview, I had to raise Hamas rockets. You know, in 2014, just talk facts, in two, at the end of the conflict in 2014 that went on for 51 days. Hamas had about 3,300 rockets at the end of that, based on what they had at the beginning, based on how many they, they fired and so forth. So now in 2021, they had 30,000. By their own admission, Israel said they destroyed 60 square miles of tunnels. And Yahya Sinwar said, that was only 5% of what they have. I do believe that was probably an exaggeration, but let's say it's half of what they have. Look, let's say it's, it's all of what they have. Think about what 60 square miles of tunnels represents in terms of steel, metal, electric wiring, wood, cement, and look what's happening on the surface in Gaza. These are just facts. So they spent seven years building up tunnels not to protect their people, but their fighters and their weapons. They built up, they used all this material not to build up Gaza, but only to pursue what is their strategy of resistance. Tell me how that serves the well-being of Palestinians in Gaza. I mean, again, I just, I'm quite willing to talk facts. You know, another fact, by the way, so Israel got out of Gaza in 2005, August, September 2005. Hamas takes over a little less than two years later through a coup. Israel did not impose the, the embargo, the quarantine, until Hamas took over. You know, in the first six months after Israel withdrew from Gaza, there were half a dozen attacks just on the crossing points between Israel and Gaza. What, the crossing points were a favor to Israel? This is how all the material came into Gaza, or how Gazan workers could go into Israel. So why are you attacking the crossing? There were six crossing points. Because they attacked, the Israelis reduced them to two. Who suffered? I mean, I... I just want to say, let's just talk what has happened, what are the facts. There will be facts she will cite about Israeli behavior, which by the way are right. The things the Israelis do that they shouldn't do. We don't have more credibility by denying that, but the unwillingness to see ultimately who's responsible for Gaza, you know, that you know, that just requires a serious discussion. And also, I mean, you just look at the behavior of Hamas and who they are and what their ideology is. They're not a civil rights movement. Yeah. I'm wondering if you could talk to um, issues of US unreliability with its allies, possibly dating back to uh, Yemen and Egypt. In regards to like Gaddafi giving up uh, nuclear 
city of weapons, and then um, US effectively allowing it to fall apart in other country, or again, Egyptian government siding with Muslim Brotherhood, then then flip-flopping, kind of a, you know, a double flip-flop. And how is that perceived by kind of um, both our allies and enemies abroad in those situations, which happened, well, this is almost two decades ago. Yeah. Well, um, one thing I'll say, I started to smile because I was going to tell a story, but I won't. Um, <laughs> look, for those in the region, this is not an avocation, it's a preoccupation. So every one of these things, they will know and they will cite chapter and verse. They'll cite the way you betrayed the Kurds in the 1970s. You know, in every single case where we were found wanting, they can cite those examples. Now, my response in many cases was, it's not like you guys were prepared to stand up and do very much on your own. So, you know, it's, you need us, but you're also important to us. I think it's, it's not really, in the end, it's not that productive if you want to get into a historical debate about who did what. Uh, is you know, the fact that we have a mixed record, I'll put it that way, in the region, is that understood in the region? Yeah, it doesn't change the fact they still basically feel they need us or they look to us. So we, you know, I, I often kind of preach for a kind of honest relationship in a candid, Set of discussions. You know, we'll be we'll be straight with you. Uh, you know, I, I often say we should have these quiet adult conversations. Uh, and they have complaints, make them. We have complaints, here's what they are. Okay, now that we've cleared the air, let's talk about what we can do. What are the range of things we actually can do? What are the things that they want from us? Look, when I wrote a piece after I was I was in Saudi Arabia the last week of July, and I wrote a piece when I came back because I wrote it with a colleague of mine who had been on the trip. And what the two of us were struck by was what we were hearing was we don't really know what the what the administration wants in the region. So we made the case, you know, why don't we spell out? I, I think the administration still needs to do this. Spell out, look, what is it? that we see as at stake in the region. What is it we're prepared to do on our own to address that? What is it we would ask others in the region to be prepared to do to also meet that? But in the first instance, we have to be able to spell out, you know, what is it? Do we want this region to collapse in total disorder? Do we want this region to become characterized by nothing but failed states? Do we want, you know, the waterways like not just the Strait of Hormuz, uh, but if you look at the mouth of the Red Sea, you want these to be threatened? I mean, do we want this to be a platform for terror again? Yes, yes, I mean, there, we have a set of interests, but we're not really spelling them out. And we're not really spelling out what we're prepared to do about it. One of the things we heard is that we see individual responses to what is an individual problem, but we don't see anything that sort of gets it all together. Okay, that's something that's needed. And it, it helps deal with some of what you're raising about, yeah, there are doubts about us, for sure. But we have some legitimate doubts about some of our friends too. I'm getting a sign. Studying diplomacy with Dennis Ross is like learning Torah with Rashi. That's all I can say. <laughs> you can all agree on that principle for tonight. But ever, Dennis, it's fabulous to learn from you so much at the tip of your hands, whether the facts or your experiences. It's a remarkable educational experience. So thank you for making the trip and looking forward to tomorrow. Thank you. Navigation. It's a critically important word. You used it before. And talk about folks navigating. 
the academic engagement network, Miriam helping our faculty navigate the really treacherous waters on campus, hugely important. My colleague Sammy Rahami from the JCRC is helping us navigate through uh, all the technological challenges, but no technological challenges tonight. So thank you everybody who joined us virtually. Benji at Hillel, what you do to help our students navigate day to day the campus experience, celebrate everything that the University of Minnesota means. President Udoff, I doubt there was any University of Minnesota president who did more for the undergraduate experience at the University of Minnesota than you really elevated it here. So let's give a round of applause to President Udoff. Yeah. And as a point of personal privilege, I want to point out a gentleman who's here today, uh, Don, Don Patton. He has the World War II Roundtable named for Harold C. Deutsch, who was a professor at the University of Minnesota. And I don't know if there's anybody in this state who has done more to advance World War II knowledge than Don Patton. He's a great friend of the Jewish community and always talking about Jewish issues as related to World War II, which of course, American issues too, but just a remarkable person. And thank you, Don, for coming tonight and joining us. Let's have a round of applause for Don. Thank you, everybody who joined us. This is a grand collective effort, Hillel, JCRC, AEN, everybody in this room, because Deborah Lipstadt likes to say, uh, Let's have more joy than oi in life too. And that's really important. Also for whatever challenges we face, there's so much more that is wonderful and good in this world. And as you say, you can have a little element of hope and diplomacy too, right? Very good, Dennis. So thank you for coming tonight. Thanks everybody here for what you do for the community. Lonnie Goldsmith with TC Jufo, thanks for covering it tonight. And uh, Shana Tova, be well everyone.